Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Creating Supportive Climates for LGBTQ Students. Uh, this is part of a webinar series put on by the School Safety Technical Assistance Center, and the series is focused on school climate improvement. Well, I'm Patty Mattern with the School Climate Safety Technical Assistance Center, uh, and we are joined today by Clark Holscher from St. Paul Public Schools. First, you might ask, what is school climate? The National School Climate Center defines school climate as the quality and character of school life. Uh, and the school climate is based on kind of the experience of students, parents, and school staff members. School climate improvement is an evidence-based practice that fosters student engagement and school connectedness. It is also the most effective way to support student learning by preventing bullying and harassment. When schools take specific action to create positive school climate, the experience of everyone in the school community improves. This leads to better student engagement and connectedness. In fact, research has shown that intentional school climate improvement improves student attendance, improves academic achievement, improves student and staff retention, increases graduation rates, and reduces discipline disparities. As we look at ways to improve our school environments for LGBTQ students and all students, it is helpful to know a bit about our student population. So let's take a look at data from the 2016 Minnesota Student Survey. From that survey, we can see that 10.6% of ninth grade students said they were bisexual, lesbian, or gay, or not sure. Meanwhile, 9.8% of 11th graders said they were bisexual, lesbian, or gay, or not sure. The 2016 Minnesota Student Survey also provides information on transgender, genderqueer, and gender fluid students. 2.8% of ninth graders said they were transgender, genderqueer, gender fluid, or unsure about gender identity. 2.5% of 11th graders described themselves as transgender, genderqueer, gender fluid, or unsure about their gender identity. Whether you look at state or national statistics, research shows that LGBTQ students report be being bullied and harassed at disproportionately higher rates than non-LGBTQ youth. In this slide from the 2016 Minnesota Student Survey, it shows that 29.4% of lesbian and gay females reported that they experienced bullying or harassment in the past month. This compares with 15.5% of heterosexual females who reported being bullied or harassed in the last month. Creating safe and supportive school environments for our LGBTQ students is not only critical to their health and well-being, but essential for them to learn and succeed academically. There are many things that school staff can do to improve school climate for LGBTQ students. You can be supportive of students by letting them know you care about them and their safety. You can make sure you're creating a welcoming environment. Take a look at your policies in your schools and see if your policies really are inclusive of LGBTQ students. Respond and speak out when you hear LGBTQ slurs or bias comments. Let people know that you're not going to tolerate such bias. Another key thing to do is to support your gender sexuality alliances, which in the past were often called gay-straight alliances. These student clubs really provide spaces and support for LGBT students, and students who attended schools with GSAs reported hearing fewer homophobic rem remarks and they had a better sense of connectedness. One of the key things is also to make sure that you have an LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. 
And today, again, I introduce Clark Holscher. They is a program specialist for Out for Equity in St. Paul Public Schools. Clark is here to discuss LGBTQ plus inclusive and affirming curriculum, how it contributes to creating school climates that affirm students' racial and cultural identity. During this webinar, we will also explore school policies, student groups, supportive educators, and working with the families of LGBTQ students. Well, thanks for the introduction, Patty. Uh, my name is Clark Holscher, and I have a doctorate from the University of Minnesota in curriculum and instruction. And I also have a minor in education psychology. So I love statistics, but I won't go too deeply into those with you today. My pronoun is they, and I've been in St. Paul Public Schools for five years. And I was a teacher educator at the University of Minnesota for five years before that, and taught in charter schools and public schools in the area um, for five years prior to that. But I did grow up in Texas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, LGBT plus students and inclusion within our school climates, why it really matters for our students who are LGBTQ plus, but also for all of our students, and how the how and what of attending to gender and sexual diversity in education, and also some of the ways that we can personalize learning around LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum. I do want to just be really clear when I'm saying LGBTQ plus, I'm saying lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and the reason I say plus is because there are more than 100 other identities used to describe non-straight, non-cisgender identities. I don't know anyone who identifies as a plus, so it's not an identity term. Um, but one thing I do um, hear frequently from our students and from our families is that they really want to be included and named. I was at a meeting with parents just on Monday evening, and a parent at one of our schools said that our GSA was not talking enough about our two-spirit students, and so that's one other very important identity that falls into this umbrella. Um, that's part of our, the heritage of our Dakota students and our indigenous population here in Minnesota. So I do really use this foundation around courageous conversations. I'm not going to go very deeply into this because I really want to focus on our LGBTQ plus students within this, but I will isolate race in the conversations because it's very essential to it. doesn't mean I'm only going to talk about race or that we'd ever be asked to only talk about race, but it's very important to attend to our whole students and all of their different identities that they're bringing with them um, so that students feel like they can show up fully in our classroom and school environments. So some parameters for today. I'm going to isolate the intersection of gender and sexual orientation with race. I'm going to work from a place assuming that our LGBTQ students are normal, valid, and they're absolutely welcome in our schools. We agree to move professionally on towards improving the experiences of our LGBTQ students. So taking some perspective, just to kind of like frame the context and experience of our students. Just for a moment, think to yourself about some recent national or international news um, and events like that might be affecting our LGBTQ plus students and staff and families. And then for a moment, consider how that might be different for LGBTQ students, staff, and families of color. Now, if we were actually in a room together, I'd want us to share a little bit around that. Um, but an event that pops up for me recently is um, that there are several states right now who have been proposing legislation about um, how LGBTQ plus people can show up in the workplace or be treated by their employer. Um, in the United States, there are still many states in which someone can actually be fired because they're lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or any of these other identities. And as there's been efforts to, for instance, in Minnesota end conversion therapy that brings up these issues in the media, but then when kids or parents or families hear negativity around it, it's taken very personally and it's felt in a way that feels very scary and threatening to a lot of our kids and to a lot of their families. So I'm going to just briefly touch on vocabulary. Um, this is here you can go back to. The reason I use this particular model, this is called the genderbred person, first of all because like this is a very friendly looking little genderbred person. Um, so students and families often don't feel particularly threatened by this image. 
It's also free and available in the public commons, and so I can use it and I don't need to check in with the person who owns this image. But it does emphasize the difference between some vocabulary that oftentimes can get muddled together and create some confusion. It's easier to talk with people when we're clear about the language and what we're actually talking about. So the concept of gender gets confused sometimes with how someone identifies themselves, with how they express their gender, and that might include what shoes they wear, their hairstyle, how they sit, even their voice intonations, um, the clothing they choose to wear, the length of their hair, whether or not they wear jewelry, whether or not they wear makeup, which kinds of makeup, where they wear it, the length of their nails. So gender expression is very big and complex. It can even include interests, like you know, if, if the student's more interested in trucks or dolls or in makeup or lizards, um, that's all part of expression. Then there's biological sex, which really focuses on like chromosomes and hormones, and then that's all very distinct from sexual or romantic orientation and how people feel about other people. One important thing here is that these things are not binary, and so while Many folks may have experienced the idea, like biologically, that there's just two sexes. Um, when I was an upper division student at the University of Texas in the biological sciences, I became very aware that there were people who were neither completely male in a, a sense that I'd been led to believe, or completely female in that it was more simplified. I came to understand that there were a whole range of intersex conditions that affect as many as one out of a thousand people. And so there are ways in which someone's hormones or their body parts or their chromosomes may not align in the simplistic way that we teach in like ninth grade biology classes or 10th grade biology classes. And so even on something like biological sex, there are degrees of femaleness or maleness that are more complex. That was very, became very clear to me as an educator due to some of the needs some of my students had. And I actually had IEPs for students who had intersex conditions that I needed to attend to in more complex ways. And being more aware of that and the impact of creating um, or of reinforcing simplistic ideas of that and what the impact that had on my students who did have intersex conditions or family members who did. I'm thinking about um, any of these other terms. You can close your eyes or think of a student you know probably who may show up in ways that are a little bit more feminine or a little bit more masculine and it's even possible for a student to show up very feminine and very masculine at the same time. A student might, for instance, have painted long fingernails, but be, you know, show up to school wearing a tie and more traditionally masculine shoes. Um, additionally, thinking about um, gender identity, there are students who identify as like gender fluid, and they may identify more strongly as a girl or more strongly as a boy from day to day. And there are some students who identify as like non-gendered or agender. So again, thinking, getting out of that framework of thinking it as, of, as binary is helpful to understanding our students. I'm not going to talk much about sexual orientation here, but there are lots of different words that students use to identify any aspect of themselves along these different spectrums. When I do use the term transgender, I'm really trying to denote someone whose gender has changed from the gender that they were assigned at birth. Of course, acknowledging that in the United States, because we have ultrasounds, many people assign gender to children even before they're born. And that works for most of our kids. And you know, the statistic that Patty gave, about 2.7% of our students have that experience where their gender is different. So that means that they're, uh, these kids are always present in our school environments, but for most of our kids, that's not what they experienced. So in St. Paul Public Schools, um, I'm missing a slide here. So let me say a little bit more here about um, these identities. In the school setting, most of the time, we're operating with our kids around their gender identity or around their gender expression. And I want to emphasize that where I see the most challenge is where staff get into students' lives in ways that may feel violating around students' privacy. And so they may ask, Unintentionally, often with actually positive intention, they might ask a student to reveal something about their sexual orientation or about their body parts, and that's where I see educators get into challenges. Um, kids' body parts, kids' interests in other kids at the individual level just really isn't what we attend to in schools. 
we're mostly interacting with our kids at the identity level. And like, how do they see themselves? Do they see themselves in the curriculum in the classroom? Do they feel respected and welcomed? Um, but of course, we all notice how people are showing up around their gender expression and whether or not we've created an inclusive, well, like welcoming and affirming environment, other peers may react to how they're expressing themselves and their gender. So here in St. Paul Public Schools, um, you see our data from 2013 and 2016 from the Minnesota Student Survey. And so you heard from Patty that it was about 10% of our students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning in the state of Minnesota. In St. Paul Public Schools, we have a higher percentage of students. Um, I think the average of these ends up being about 16.7% in um, 2016. So we do, um, our population is more, we have a higher level of students who are LGBTQ, and some of the reasons I can't, explain it all, but um, I do hear from parents who elect to send their children to St. Paul Public Schools because they do perceive that it is a more welcoming and affirming place um, for LGBTQ students. What's missing from the data um, and what we are not able to really speak to is other identities that might fall into this. For instance, our intersex students, um, our asexual students, or our two-spirit students. And of course, this data does not include our transgender students. So in St. Paul Public Schools, um, our transgender students are about 3% of our student population. So one assumption that is often made about LGBTQ students and it's reinforced in the media is that LGBTQ people are mostly white. And that's really not true. If you disaggregate the data from the state um, or here what's shown is in St. Paul Public Schools, you see that our students who are LGBTQ are reflective of our entire student body population. Um, I will note here that our Somali and American Indian students, that this is not necessarily um, a statistically strong measure because we have so few students who are both American Indian and LGBTQ identified or Somali and LGBTQ identified because our populations in those groups are pretty small to begin with. But what I really want to drive home here is that LGBTQ students are reflective of all of our racial, cultural, and linguistic identities and it's really important that we not make assumptions that LGBTQ students are white and that we really reflect and question it. Um, some of the calls that I get um, are involved the idea that like a student is misbehaving or making fun of LGBTQ students, and often this is like a student of color, and then when I explore the situation a little further, what becomes clear is that the student who's perceived as doing some sort of wrongdoing is a member of the LGBTQ community. And, but as a member of the LGBTQ community who's also a student of color, there's that cognitive bias of lending them to be sometimes misread as misbehaving and it stems to, it seems, be because the administrator or the teacher at first glance didn't imagine that the student might actually be a part of the LGBTQ community. So in general, why attend to gender and sexual diversity? So Patty gave you a great introduction to that. So here's some more in-depth analysis of the experiences of our LGB students and are questioning students compared to their heterosexual peers. This is a very complicated analysis. Again, I really love statistics. Our straight students, our heterosexual students, are the middle line here. And so the bars to the right indicate negative things that our students who are LGBTQ are experiencing. And the degree to the left is essentially the positive things that our LGBTQ students are missing out on. So looking at um, just mental distress, our LGBTQ students have incredibly statistically high levels of mental distress compared to their heterosexual peers. Looking at um, things we all care about like commitment to learning um, and going on to higher education, our LGBTQ students have a lot less commitment to learning and higher education. Um, our students who are LGBTQ also feel a lot less supported in the school environment. So all of these are statistically significant outcomes. Some of these are incredibly severe if you look at these and know information about standard deviations. These are very, very severe and concerning. These outcomes interfere with everything that we believe is important in schools, helping students succeed academically, helping them feel welcome, coming to school, attending school, doing well on tests, interacting with their peers, going to higher education programs, enrolling in more challenging classes. 
So attending to our students who are LGBTQ intentionally and proactively to create affirming and welcoming environments will increase our scores and outcomes around attendance, completing high school, enrolling in post-secondary programs. Any, I guess I want to take just a moment about any questions up to this point. I'm not sure what appropriate wait time is on a webinar. Okay, well I'm going to go ahead and move on. And of course if you have a question, go ahead and feel free to type it out and we can always come back to it. So again, when students are victimized, we get negative outcomes. So higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of missing school, and lowered outcomes that we really want to see, like school belonging, educational aspirations, self-esteem, or academic achievement. So creating affirming, welcoming environments addresses getting all of these um, outcomes in the direction that we want to see so students are more successful. <coughs> Excuse me. So in general, the reason I ask my colleagues um, and the reason we attend to gender and sexual diversity in St. Paul Public Schools is because, first and foremost, we believe in the importance of diversity and equity, because we want our students to always be safe at school, because we want them to be physically and emotionally well, because we want them to be college and career ready. I hear from employers that they really want to hire people who can get along with each other, because, of course, we have policies like our bullying policy um, following the Safe and Supportive Schools Law, also our student non-discrimination policy and other inclusive policies, and because there are Minnesota and federal laws that we are beholden to and that we can get into trouble. So first and foremost, it's about what's good for students and our, from our deep belief and a commitment to doing that, but also we don't, we don't want to be out of alignment with the things that we're responsible for doing. We really do believe that it's our job, that every student, staff member, and family deserve a safe and supportive school environment that fosters positive self-esteem, respect for others, and academic success. So we have a lot of policies. If you want to see them more in detail, they're available um, at this address. But one of the policies that's actually my favorite is our 602.01, our Multicultural, Intercultural, Non-Racist, Non-Sex Bias, Gender and Disability Fair Education Policy. And what this policy does um, is really make it clear to our educators in St. Paul Public Schools that being inclusive and affirming is not just something that's nice to do, but it's something that we really want them to do and that we are committed to supporting them doing. So the how and what of attending to that. Oh, we do have a question now. Okay, so I'll just pause before we go on to this next part. So the first question, um, do we have a sense of the openness acceptance of LGBTQ plus teachers and how that affects the classroom experiences? Sure, absolutely. Um, there is some limited research about staff being out, um, but it's not very broad. Um, we do know that students recognize supportive educators and that one element of being a supportive educator can include being out and being open towards other LGBTQ people. Um, we know from other data about representation that having educators who are more like our students from marginalized communities makes a big difference. Um, I definitely hear anecdotally from students that they feel very positive when they see out and open members um, of the, the school community. So in all public schools, we do support our out LGBTQ students. Um, or sorry, our out LGBTQ staff, and of course, in the state of Minnesota, all of our educators as well as our students have a right to be out around their sexual orientation or gender identity, just like they're any of our heterosexual educators or um, cisgendered educators. So another question, can you touch on GSA piece again? So the older name for a GSA was Gay Straight Alliance. We don't use that as much anymore, locally or nationally, 
because that leaves out students who are transgender, two-spirit, intersex, um, bisexual, and our students notice that. Our kids, especially our marginalized kids, can take these things very, very literally. So I was working with for instance, a student who is bisexual, and I was like, well, why don't you go to the GSA? And he's like, well, it's for gay or straight people. And I, I'm not gay, I'm not straight, I'm bisexual. And so for the kids to feel more welcome, a more inclusive and affirming frame needed to be set. And so we started using gender and sexuality alliances. That's what our national organizations are also doing now. Um, some different, it doesn't really matter what the club is, calls itself. We have some student groups who call themselves the Rainbow Coalition, some clubs who might call them like, you know, unicorns after school. Some of them take more open ended names like um, Student Diversity Club. But whatever that space is that's really intentionally serving our LGBTQ plus students. That space is really important that it's open to allies. And so we have a lot of students who show up as allies um, to support their peers, sometimes because they have family members who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Sometimes those kids might be questioning or might still be in the closet, um, but we always make sure that our allies are welcome as well. Clark, we had another question about Minnesota student survey questions. Do you want to go back and talk about that now, or do we want to wait until the end and see if we have time? Because I want to be... Yeah, I want to be really intentional about getting to the things that make a difference for our kids. It's really clear they're struggling, and unless we do things differently, we're not going to see changes to those outcomes. Anyone is welcome to give me a call or follow up by email about the particular items or the measures we see, um, but I really want to focus on what we can do to change those numbers. So the how and what of attending to gender and sexual diversity um, in education. What we know, and Patty overviewed these, is that these four strategies are effective in co and correlate to better outcomes for members of our school communities who are students who are LGBTQ identified. So comprehensive policies, having student groups like GSAs, having supportive educators. There's a big difference between when kids can identify six support, at least six supportive educators they do even better when they can identify like 11 to 13. Um, LGBT inclusive curriculum is also really important. And the reason I'm gonna focus on LGBT inclusive curriculum is because it's correlated to the highest levels of student success. I don't think that LGBT inclusive curriculum is on its own magical. The reason I think that it correlates to better outcomes, and this is just my theory here, is because if we have inclusive curriculum, it's probably likely that we have really good policies. And so our educators feel like they're able to do um, and address issues in the curriculum. They feel supported by their leaders. Teachers really need to feel supported around um, offering inclusive curriculum and affirming curriculum. And they need to know that their school leader has their back if a parent or someone has a question or pushes back about why they're talking about LGBT, LGBTQ people in the classroom. Um, again, if there's a GSA, the students are more likely to advocate for LGBT inclusive curriculum. They're more likely to feel affirmed and welcome to ask questions that lead teachers to um, develop LGBT inclusive curriculum. And of course, supportive educators, I think, are somewhat obviously more likely to have LGBT inclusive curriculum. So I think that these all fit together, and so they come together into this pinnacle of having LGBT inclusive curriculum that correlates to the highest improved outcomes for LGBT students. So what I mean by that is that in schools that have higher levels of LGBT inclusive curriculum, their LGBTQ community members and students in the school do better. So LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum is coherent. It takes an approach that's anticipatory and proactive has a strategy for delivering equal opportunities, it's connected to the diversity policies in the district. It should involve the whole institution. It should really match provision to student needs. It should also be reflective and reviewing and refining and using input from the people that we're most hoping to, imp like to improve conditions for. So if the LGBTQ students feel like the curriculum is working, that it's positive and affirming, then that is a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. Um, without LGBT inclusive curriculum, what LGBT students report is reflected here. Often without realizing it, public schools send a message to youth LGBTs that at best something is wrong with them or at worst that they don't exist. 
there is simply a psychological void when you perceive that you are so wrong or so unacceptable that you can't even be talked about in the school environment. You can't see yourself reflected all around you like other students get to see themselves reflected in the environment around them. And so by having inclusive curriculum, the kids get to see themselves in affirming positive ways. So what that includes is for our kids to be able, who are LGBT, to be able to see themselves like, hey, I'm a whole person, I'm out there, people like me are contributing to great things in our society and our culture. And it also opens our window for kids who are not LGBT to understanding, oh, there are great LGBT people out there, they're doing great things. And here's what it means to be respectful and affirming of LGBT people in our community. So it, I think the part of the reason why this is more effective than like a GSA is that GSAs are attended by students usually outside of the school day. So students are electing to go to that group. And so they are already a little bit more inclined to being supportive of LGBT people. But when we're supporting LGBT people and demonstrating what it is to be affirming and respectful of LGBT people in our general classrooms, then everybody is having the opportunity to learn how to be respectful and accepting and affirming of LGBT people. So in our St. Paul Public Schools, this is connected to multiple policies, our racial equity policy, our gender inclusion policy, our curriculum policy. We connect it to personalized learning. We connect it to our teacher development and evaluation process. It's connected to our work around safe and supportive schools. It's connected to what we do around culturally responsive or culturally relevant teaching, which I know has been getting a lot of attention in the state of Minnesota. So it's connected to how we build relationships that are reciprocal in our classrooms, to the realness of the subject matter. Students who hear about LGBT people I mean, all of our students know about LGBT people. They're clearly out there in our world. Our, some of our most sensational musicians identify as LGBT. Some of our performers, um, whether it's comedy or movies, are out. And so if a kid is seeing all that diversity out in the world, but then in the school there's a disconnect about it, what I hear from kids is that they feel like their teachers aren't being very real about what's going on in the world. It's about rigor, really making sure that we have high consistent standards, it's about relevance to the kids' lives and experiences. So we th while we think of curriculum often as about textbooks, I want to emphasize real quick that there's also informal curriculum, and so these are measures of inclusive LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. So thinking about online access, for instance, checking school filters. Sometimes school filters are set too restrictively and words like gay or bisexual get completely blocked. That means students can't find access to information like the Trevor Project or coming out or even searching for colleges that have dorms for LGBTQ students or special programs and supports. Um, making sure that there's LGBTQ materials in the library, like is there an LGBTQ plus section? I have amazing librarians and media specialists in St. Paul Public Schools who have beautiful curated sections on these materials and they make sure that it's reflective of our students' racial and cultural identities too. Thinking about our events and activities, are we still using terms like prom king and queen or are we using more terms like prom royalty so that more students have access and it's not based on this, again, idea of gender that's um, more binary than how many of our young people are experiencing gender. Do we have student groups? Okay, great. Do we have a GSA? But is it something that's just tolerated by the school or is it something that's sponsored and actively supported by the school? Is the person who's running the GSA given a stipend like people who lead the robotics club. That matters. Um, the language really matters. Kids notice if we're saying something like ladies and gentlemen because they perceive that's leaving some people out. When we have other options that we can use for our students like scholars or friends, think about the images on the walls. Are students really seeing themselves on the posters and the programs? What about the representation in the staff? Are there out and affirmed LGBTQ plus staff members? So transitioning to talking about elements of the more um, formal curriculum, I want to take a moment to talk about developmental, like developmentally where this fits in because sometimes I experience misconceptions about the idea that like, yeah, sure, we can do LGBTQ inclusive curriculum, but we're gonna wait till like high school or maybe till at least middle school. I wanna really emphasize that this is, I think, largely about what we do and the tone we set in elementary settings. Very, very early, kids are looking around in elementary and they're noticing what are the family norms, what are the gender norms. They know who's at home for their friends, whether or not there's, you know, 
one mom, a grandma, two moms, they are checking that out, what is out there. By middle elementary, like, you know, second to third, fourth grade, they're noticing that there's diversity around people's relationships. They're noticing that there's diversity around people's gender. And they're picking up the messages about whether or not any of that diversity is okay. By late elementary, they're still seeing all of that, the norms for families, for genders, that diversity. But by late elementary, like fourth and fifth grade, they're personalizing it. And they're questioning, well, who am I in that? And where do I fit in? And whether or not I'm okay. And so if in mid-elementary, they got messages that that diversity was not okay, then by the time that they're figuring themselves out and putting words to who they are, that can be coming within a very negative frame. And I think it is therefore not surprising that we start seeing heightened levels of anxiety or depression among our late elementary kids as early as third grade, but third, fourth, and fifth around their gender or sexual orientation. And it's because of those negative messages. And whether or not they were picking up the negative messages at home or in the community, they're picking it up. And if we're not doing um, a good job being more affirming and being more um, welcoming, then we're not upsetting those negative messages that are out there. We're not challenging them. And so thinking about early childhood family education, um, I, I, one thing that I find very helpful is making sure that all of our families have a sense very early on that there is diversity of genders beyond male and female, that we have, like, that we don't really have boy things or girl things, and that families may include more than one mom or more than one dad. Um, and so that's the message that the littles are getting when they're in or ECFE classes, but for the parent education side, understand, like, helping the parents be proactively understanding that there is diversity of gender and sexual orientation that's occurring in our school communities among our staff, our families, and our students, and that schools are responsible for being welcoming and serving all of our families and students, and that research really indicates that supporting children about how they know themselves to be leads to the best outcomes. I'm going to refer you to the Family Acceptance Project that has amazing research about what kids who are LGBT experience as being supportive by the adults and family members in their lives. There's also great resources about early childhood family education um, and about creating LGBT inclusion in elementary settings from gender spectrum and welcoming schools. In elementary, like I mentioned, the kids are picking up that message about the diversity that's out there in gender and also for their families. Um, so helping them to see that diversity out there and helping them to pick up messages that members of our community who are diverse in their gender or sexual orientation, whether it's our staff, our families, our students, are welcome and that we are doing the best we can do to be supportive and friendly and meet their needs. As the students move forward, they will absolutely begin to hear words like gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, and they may use those words in negative or positive ways. And so they do need some support learning that there's nothing wrong with being gay, but at the point, for instance, that we might call someone else gay, that that becomes violating and kind of can be experienced as hurtful to another child. And that might be violating or hurtful whether or not that child sees themselves as gay or not. What I kind of tend to tell the kids is that our identities are for ourselves. We get to choose them, we get to apply them to ourselves, but when someone else uses our identity against us or in any way that sounds negative, it can be very, very hurtful and violating. And so we respect the identities that people share with us, but we don't ascribe identities to other people. And if someone has gifted and shared their own identity with us, that we respect their privacy and we don't tell other people about it. The kids also need that message that, you know, whatever your beliefs are, whatever your family believes, that's fine. Here in school or, you know, out at jobs, we all have the responsibility to be respectful of people, whatever their identity or their, around their gender or their sexual orientation is. 
and that there are laws and rules in our schools and in our society that protect people who are different around their gender or sexual orientation. And that if you violate those, there will be some consequences. And so I really do believe in restorative practices and helping kids learn how to be respectful and caring towards members of our community who might be marginalized. And so I really advocate for restorative understanding-based consequences. But I know, of course, if students are engaging in bullying or being mean to members of our LGBTQ community, then we may need to take more serious um, responses to those behaviors. Again, see great resources from Gender Spectrum and Welcoming Schools on their websites. So here's a little example going into more detail about some of the concepts that might be addressed in elementary settings. And I wanted to emphasize these a little bit more than the resources that um, I'm going to use um, or I'm going to talk about for the secondary level because I think it may be that as educators we've seen this a little bit less on what it looks like to be respectful and affirming of gender and sexual um, diversity in our elementary settings. And so, for instance, really early on, helping kids um, disrupt the idea that around gender stereotypes, and so getting that message across, just as an example, that toys are toys, hair is hair, colors are colors, clothes are clothes, um, and that there may be some messages about some of those things being for girls or some for boys, but that that's not what we're going to like reinforce or focus on here in our classroom, um, and that any kids can do these things. And part of the reason why it's really important to disrupt those things is because we want to make sure that all of our kids have equal access and opportunity for instance, we may have um, girls who want to be auto mechanics or welders, and those are fantastic jobs. But if we're not disrupting the idea that, like, you know, girls have to have, you know, lots of makeup or dresses or long nails, then that's going to be, you know, a barrier to any of our students, whatever their gender or sexual orientation is, to being, access, being able to access the careers and opportunities that are well paid, that are well needed, that are well needed in our community. So for our secondary students, there are opportunities across the curriculum um, at all levels and in all disciplines to be LGBTQ inclusive. And so, for example, in literacy, um, making sure that we make space for narratives and perspectives of LGBTQ plus people of many different and intersecting racial and cultural identities. So for instance, here is an image from the film Two Spirits. Um, and again, Two-Spirit is an identity used by our Native American or indigenous people of um, the United States. And there are different tribes have different specific words for that, and that's all discussed in this beautiful film. Um, and there's great books and poetry written by LGBTQ people who are also Native or indigenous. Within social studies, understanding that LGBTQ plus people um, are there and within the frame of world and American history, understanding the contributions of people who are LGBTQ plus to the civil rights movement. For instance, um, having students learn about Bayard Rustin and the role he played as a, a gay African American man um, to the efforts of the African American civil rights movement and like for instance organizing the Million Person or Million Man March. In math, examples like LGBTQ people in scenarios or when we're making charts or looking at data. So here's just like one little graph um, that looks at gender. And this one is about connectivity between different parts of the brain. So we can talk about um, LGBTQ people in affirming inclusive ways um, within math, within science. Um, I was a biology and physics teacher, so my curriculum was affirming. It was all really guided by questions that students asked, and that was what led me in those directions. But teaching biological sex to be inclusive of intersex conditions, distinguishing between sex and gender. Um, of course, when we're talking about things like HIV, making sure that we are being really um, affirming and that we're not reinforcing negative stereotypes. And that, that really does take effort to be disruptive. Um, within health, it's really important to discuss common terminology and identities, emphasizing the unique needs of LGBTQ plus people for their health care, the diversity of gender and sexual orientation should be respected by medical systems. So helping the kids understand that if they're gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, questioning, or transgender, that that's information that their doctor may benefit from knowing and that their doctor ought to be respectful of and so they can get the best medical care possible. Um, also, of course, it has implications within reproductive or family planning and can be affirmed through um, focusing on differences in bodies and orientations. 
So we have a lot of um, great community partners doing physical and sexual health education who are inclusive and affirming of that diversity. And so those community organizations, whatever the organizations are near you, can probably provide suggestions and supports around that. So wrapping up, how are we on time? Okay, so we've got 10 minutes. Um, so we can think about like what was share worthy, what questions do we have, um, how does LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum support safe and supportive schools, you know, what are next steps? So right now uh, we welcome any questions you have. We'll give you a few minutes to ask your questions. I'll emphasize that like when it, I kind of gave this very brief overview, there are numerous books um, written and published about LGBTQ inclusion and literacy education. So educators who are in these specific disciplines, when they are invited to do this work, when it's expected and asked for by them, the resources are out there and they can tap into it and like what it is to be inclusive and affirming within each of those different disciplines. So how do you suggest administration explains changes? So my favorite thing, and I keep this really in my back pocket, is this part right here. Why are we doing this? So I usually find that the parents that I'm working with, and so in St. Paul Public Schools, we have a lot of students, a lot of parents, and we are doing inclusive curriculums across disciplines, across grade levels. There have been very, very few occasions, like I can think of like two or three, where parents have really pushed this issue. Um, but emphasizing these six reasons has been very successful. So our administrators know these reasons and they practice responding to parent questions. And so I really don't see this as different than like if a parent comes and says, you know, why are we doing a celebration around Martin Luther King Day? Like why are we doing um, any action about bullying? And just what I find, though, is really important is that the administrators or the teachers have to have really good clarity about the why for themselves. And so if when they get that question from a parent, they're not sure why they're doing it, then the parents can often feel uncomfortable about it. So being able to express really clearly, you know, like, we want to make sure everybody's welcome here and we have a lot of parents and students and staff who are LGBTQ and we know that their outcomes um, have not been well, it's like they haven't been well attended to and their outcomes haven't been very good historically. And I want to make sure that, you know, as the administrator here, that all of my students are successful and can go and get great jobs in our community and contribute. We also have policies and laws that make sure that we follow through on our obligations. So around community partnerships, um, so I have community, I was just at our um, queer youth prom, and so like what are community partnerships? I mean, for instance, like we just had queer youth prom hosted by Hyatt Regency downtown Minneapolis. So some of our community partners are just out there in the business community. Target is a community partner that is being very supportive and inclusive around welcoming and inclusive um, school environments. If you look at their advertising campaigns, you'll notice that they have been doing a lot of um, material around lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning trans folks. Um, there's also people who are, or businesses who, most of our big employers around the Twin Cities have employee resource groups, and those employee resource groups are meant to really affirm and welcome and support staff from marginalized groups. So 
those community members also like visit our school GSAs. We always do background checks, of course. All volunteers have background checks. Be careful about that. Um, we also do work with our community partners. Like locally, we have Family Tree, um, who does work around sexual health and reproductive health, and also our just our medical providers. So lots of community partners who are really attending to this. Um, I think when we had our LGBTQ Youth Summit recently, it was one of the sponsors was one of our healthcare companies, like big healthcare companies in the state. So these same needs that we see in the schools, our community partners recognize as needs, whether they're in the businesses or they're like healthcare focused. So ways to engage and foster those inclusive welcoming environments. Those, how do any community partnerships come? I mean, it's almost like magic. I think when we start reaching out and saying like, here's this need, here's this thing we're doing, oftentimes the community partners come forward. Um, Sometimes the community partnerships have come because of like parents' associations with different community members. Um, one of our community partners, like some of our community partners are actually churches. And so for Queer Youth Prom, we actually get a donation from a couple churches who you know, bake pies and sell pies as a fundraiser. And then that money goes towards buying food and you know, paying for the DJs at like Queer Youth Prom. I know we talked about like a lot of different things that we can do to be supportive of LGBTQ students and our staff and our families. I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed that there's just too much. What I think is really, really important is that we're looking at what we're currently doing and we're seeing the opportunities for growth and that we're stepping forward to grow. I have no judgment about where any school or staff person or administrator is at and what they're currently doing. What I really want to see, though, is folks taking that next step. So whatever that next step is, moving forward. Wherever, like, everyone's climate is in a different place. So whether or not you have had a GSA, it's very successful, it's very active, or if you're just starting a GSA for the very first time, it's really important work. There's no point in comparing where you're at to other school districts. It's about figuring out what you can do next and what's right for your community. I would just like to add that I know Outfront Minnesota has a GSA network, so uh, if you're a staff member in a school who maybe not doesn't have a club right now, that would be an excellent resource to reach out to. They can connect you with uh, educators at other schools and work to help you get something going. There are really fantastic field trips and events available. Um, I there's. In the fall, there's an event called QQuest that's for middle school students and high school students and GSAs come together to attend that. It's focused on leadership, health, education. And then in the springtime, the Youth Summit, which is kind of like LGBTQ Youth in Government Day, the students um, do some workshops and then they are welcome to go meet with their own legislators and, and, care, like, and discuss things that are important with their legislators. There's also Queer Youth Prom, which is attended by youth from across the state and even sometimes out of state. There's Youth Pride. I hope that increasingly there will be more events um, outside of the metro region. I think that there's ways that GSAs from different schools near each other could be working together to host their own events. 
um, or going to community prides so that there's not this perception that like the metro region is like the only place to like be affirmed as an LGBTQ plus person. I know that there are great inclusive communities out um, in the broader regions of Minnesota as well. If there are no other questions, we want to thank you for joining us today. Feel free to contact Clark. Also, you can contact the uh, School Safety Technical Assistance Center.